Yesterday and Friday we had uh, our youth conference, UConn. It was an absolutely wonderful time. Mark Hart came from Arizona to lead us. He's the leader of Life Teen International. And to help you feel cooler, he said it was 115 in Phoenix when he left on uh, Friday. And he said, we're lucky at night if it gets down to 100. So uh, hopefully it makes you feel a little cooler, uh, these uh, more hot days for us in Buffalo. It really was a wonderful moment. We had about 160 young people here of our parish for uh, these two days of uh, prayer and conference. It was a beautiful sight yesterday at the 4 o'clock Mass to see the entire center section over here to my left completely filled with teenagers spilling over into both sides. It was a great sign that the, the church is alive and well. And in the evening, we ended with Eucharistic adoration, wonderful to see 160 young people kneeling in, in prayer and in praise. It was a beautiful time. And as Mark Hart began on uh, Friday with our teenagers, he said, you know, I don't know any of you and you don't know me. He said, but one thing that I know for sure is that each one of you have a story. And your families have a story, just as I have a story of my life, and my family has a story. And that was a, an image that came up a couple times through the two days together, this idea of having a, a story and a family story, a personal story. And if you think for a moment, uh, each of us here have a story. We've come from a family and has a story. And over the years, you've learned a lot about my family and my story. Of course, my story... Uh, very much involves coming from Black Rock and growing up in the home that belonged to my mom and her family. Uh, we owned that house for 109 years. I was the fourth generation to grow up in our home. And um, our whole block was the same way, really, and uh, which meant as a kid, you know, you didn't get away with anything because uh, the kids I grew up with were the children of the parents that my parents grew up with, you know, was the way it was in the old neighborhood. And of course, uh, my story includes living in the shadows of Assumption Church. Literally, we were not even a block away from the windows of the house. We could see the towers of the church. And if you couldn't see the towers of the church, you certainly could hear them because every hour they ring telling you what time it was and of course, it's six o'clock in the evening to play the Angelus calling us to prayer. And I often think back of those days and to think of my personal family and Assumption Church and to realize that my life has always really been a life lived within the life of the church. My personal family story, very close to the church itself. And of course, uh, all of the families of our parish very close with us. It was. A uh, cohesive story, not two separate stories, a story of personal life and a story of faith life, but rather one very cohesive story, I suppose, bringing some meaning to the term, the family that prays together stays together. If you take that idea and think of your own story and take that idea of what I shared with you to the readings today, and what is that we really hear? We're, we're hearing a good chunk of the story of our faith life, the very first reading from wisdom is reminding us of the night of the Exodus and reminding us of the children of Israel and God's promise for them. And you go to the second reading from Hebrews, we're hearing a large piece of the, the story. We hear almost the Reader's Digest version of the entire story of Father Abraham, his wife Sarah, their son Isaac, we hear the story of their call, and they were sent off to a new land. And we hear in between events of the story, and we hear at the end of the reading, the hallmark of that story, if you will, that moment that Abraham in his old age, over a hundred, uh, called to sacrifice his only son Isaac on Mount Moriah. 
And of course, we know this full story very well. Abraham is ready to do so, and God stops him, knowing that in faith you will not withhold your only son. And sometimes we might think, well, why would Abraham sacrifice his son? And we forget to realize that Isaac was a willing participant. Abraham, over 100 years of age, Isaac, a young man, he could have taken his dad down if he wanted to, you know. Could have said, you know, Dad, have you lost your mind? You're ready to sacrifice me. He didn't do that. He was a willing participant. And of course, we need to remember that Mount Moriah is Mount Calvary. It's the same place. It's the same mountain upon which the Temple Mount is built. And so we see on Mount Moriah, Abraham willing to sacrifice his son, his son Isaac, a willing participant to be sacrificed to fulfill God's will. On that same Mount, Mount Calvary, God the Father willing to sacrifice his son Jesus, Jesus a willing participant, willing to be sacrificed. And that call to see that you and I share in Mount Moriah, we share in Mount Calvary every time we come to the altar as Mount Calvary is present at this altar and every altar in the world as we celebrate that sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's the story of our faith. And just as we know the stories of our faith family and the stories of our personal family, perhaps a, a simple question maybe to ponder today and through the week is, what is your story? What is your story and, and how do you tell your story? How do you tell your story by the way you live your life and physically and verbally as you meet others? How is it that you share your story? How do you share the story of your family? And does your story include two separate stories, a personal story and, and a faith story, or is it integrated that your story of your family life is so integrated in one with the story of your, your faith family and your faith life? If you take all of that to the gospel, we're reminded of something very simple in the gospel, and that is to keep vigil. We hear very clearly that the servants are keeping vigil, waiting for the master to return from the wedding feast. And we hear the other image of the, of the owner of the home knew the hour that the thief was coming. He would be keeping vigil. He'd keep watch. He would not allow the thief to break into his home. Well, what does it mean to keep vigil? You know, we don't really do that so well, I don't think, in our culture today. Sometimes we keep vigil after a tragic event happens, but that's not really what it means to keep vigil. I went to, to the great theological resource to find the definition of vigil, and that great theological resource, Google, I went to Google and typed in definition of vigil and took me to uh, Merriam-Webster. Most of us will have an old copy of the book on our shelf, but now, you know, it's online. And this is what Merriam-Webster had to say. Vigil, first of all, the act of keeping awake at times when sleep is customary. Now, I suppose that might mean my homily time, I'm not sure. You know, <laughs> the act of keeping awake. <laughs> at times when sleep is customary. Second definition, an event or a period of time when a person or group stays in place and quietly waits and prays. Vigil, when a person or group in that period of time stay in place and quietly waits and prays, keeping vigil. The real question may be to ponder do you see your life as keeping a vigil? Is the very basic core, the very basic center, the basic definition of our life, one of keeping vigil, of waiting for that unknown day and hour when the Lord will call for us to go to the kingdom in heaven? I'm not sure we understand vigil so well. I have... Uh, many idiosyncrasies, and after nine years, you probably could list a number of them, you know. But uh, among my many little habits or idiosyncrasies, 
One is Halloween night. On Halloween night, around 9 o'clock or so, I will always go to the grocery store, and I go to the seasonal aisle. And I go there not to find Halloween candy greatly reduced, although I'm not above a good bargain, and I do usually walk home with it, too. But I go to see what's there. <laughs> And what do I always find in the seasonal aisle? Christmas trees. <laughs> in the three hours that the kids were shaking us down for candy, that aisle got transformed <laughs> and became, uh, you know, Christmas already. And then on December 26th, the second day of Christmas, after I have morning mass, I, I go back to the store. And I go to the seasonal aisle to see what is there and what do I find? Chocolate hearts. Here we are on day two <laughs> and we've moved on already to Valentine's Day. And I often drive home from visiting family and friends Christmas night and I, I note the number of Christmas trees already at the curb, usually at the same houses that put them up the day after Halloween. We don't really know what it means to keep vigil, to wait with longing to celebrate something. We usually dive right in, and when the celebration begins, we already we move on, you know, to the new thing. Vigil is something that is important in our faith life, important in my family life. You know, at Christmas, we would celebrate every year Christmas Eve Vigilia. That is the Christmas Eve supper in a Polish home. Italian families have very similar custom, the, the meal of the seven fish. Many uh, customs in many different ethnic backgrounds, Christmas Eve. And Christmas Eve, Vigilia, begins with the youngest of the family to be looking and keeping vigil watch through the day for the first star to come out. And I was the youngest of the family. Out of the entire family, all of the cousins, I'm the baby. And so I would be keeping vigil. I think it was a way to keep the youngest out of everybody else's hair while they were getting ready, you know. <laughs> and uh, I will confess that, you know, at times I perhaps reported stars that no one else other than me could see, you know, as I wanted to get things moving. <laughs> and uh, Vigilia, of course, begins with the breaking of the Aquatec, the Christmas wafers, we always have them available here in church for you to take home. And uh, it's a meatless meal, why? Because we're in vigil. We have uh, hay on the table and underneath to symbolize the manger. And there's always an extra place setting for the Christ child. And when uh, someone would come to the door that evening, if you knew them or not, you were to invite them to your table because that was Jesus coming to your home. And often we did not even really have Christmas cookies for dessert. Because it wasn't Christmas, it was Christmas Eve. We're in vigil, we're waiting. And it was after midnight mass and our return. That's when the kielbasa came out and the ham came out and the cookies came out. Now, now we celebrate because now it's Christmas. This idea of keeping vigil is so very important. And to see our lives as that vigil, waiting, for the unknown day and hour to see the Lord face to face and as we wait collectively together to uh, see our personal life, our family life, our faith life of helping one another be prepared for that day and hour that the Lord will call. We pray to keep that solemn vigil.